This week, we arrive at the 20th anniversary of September 11th, the coordinated attacks against American citizens and icons of the American way of life. I was in Florida as a grad student in 2001. My wife and I watched on TV as the towers collapsed in New York, pillars of steel and glass toppling down and then replaced by giant plumes of dust. For me, it was a surreal experience, something that was previously unimaginable, the terror of cinema playing out on live TV. After the first tower came down, I remember thinking, in a disorienting fog, that now, when I was in New York, I'd only see the one surviving tower left like a memorial. But then, it too came down. It was a day that changed our nation, also changed how we went about our daily activities. But also in remembering the attacks of 9-11, I see some parallels in terms of how we move through life today during the pandemic. The attacks utterly disrupted American life. Innocent people lost their lives. First responders rushed into danger. And then, over many months, tentatively, cautiously, life eventually went back to some type of normalcy, with modifications at airports, sports games, and theme parks. But there was a period where many Americans were concerned about air travel and gathering in places of mass entertainment, including theme parks. It took about four years for patterns of tourism to return to pre-9-11 levels, for Americans to again feel safe traveling to places of mass gatherings and big cities. But eventually, many aspects of pre-9-11 life did finally return. Today, a remembrance of how the events of September 11th played out inside of the American parks, at the Disney Studio, and with Disney projects in New York, and how those events changed our way of life. For months, Disney prepared celebrations in 2001. In Florida, it would be a double celebration. The resort would turn 30 on October 1st, and the resort would also celebrate Walt's 100th birthday on December 5th. But all of these plans fell apart less than three weeks before those festivities were scheduled to begin. The first plane, American Airlines Flight 11, crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, at 8.46 a.m. Initially, at least to the public, it was not clear that this was a terrorist attack. There was still a possibility that it was a tragic accident. That impression ended 17 minutes later when another plane, United Flight 175, crashed into the South Tower. Five minutes later, the FAA stopped all takeoffs and flight activity in or near New York City. At 9.31 a.m., the president, who happened to be in Florida, called the events a, quote, apparent terrorist attack. Six minutes later, another plane crashed into the western side of the Pentagon. At this point, it was presumed that the attacks organized between many planes might continue to occur at both public and privately owned sites that symbolized that American way of life. At this point, too, there were roughly 1,200 commercial jets still in the air over nearly every American city. It was unknown how many might be hijacked by terrorists, though there was at least one more suspected of being hijacked near the Capitol, a plane that would later come down in Pennsylvania as passengers worked to overtake it from terrorists. At 9.42 a.m., the FAA grounded all flights over American airspace, though it would take two and a half hours to land those 1,200 flights at airports across the United States and, in some cases, Canada and Mexico. At this point in the morning, beyond those jets, there were persistent rumors of other attacks or forthcoming attacks, such as car bombs near national landmarks in Washington, D.C., Government officials contacted what they felt might be possible targets. Near the top of that list were the Disney parks. 
At this time in California, the Disney parks hadn't yet opened for the day. But in Florida, all four parks were open, as were the two water parks and the shopping area, then called Downtown Disney. In the morning, some guests inside the park, through cell calls and texts, learned about the attacks. Though in a world before smartphones, most guests had little idea that America had been attacked. Other guests noticed unusual activity, including one guest while eating breakfast at Tony's who saw strange activity out on Main Street. Quote, we were sitting in front, where all the windows were, she said, and I noticed many cast members in business attire, with headsets walking throughout the park. Executives in Florida weren't immediately sure how they should respond. One cast member recalls being in a break room, watching the towers on TV, when an announcer broke in with news about the resort. Quote, this just in. The Walt Disney Company has just announced that it will be closing its theme parks worldwide. And literally, less than a minute after the reporter said that, he recalled, managers' beepers started going off like crazy, and they walked out of the break room. About five to ten minutes after that incident, they notified cast members of what we were going to do. Another cast member recalled, quote, while walking through Tomorrowland, I received a radio call from my leader saying the U.S. was being attacked and the park was now closed. We were instructed to execute an evacuation of the park through the front gates, the lowest tier evacuation. At 11.25, Disney World then announced that it would close down its parks, water parks, and shopping district. The announcements were intentionally vague, citing unforeseen circumstances. Most queue areas emptied out orderly, with some guests confused as to why the parks were closing. Another cast member would later explain, quote, We were told not to tell the guests what had happened unless they asked us. I remember one guest asking me and... After I told them, they just stood there blank-faced and didn't move for a bit. The trains on the Disneyland Railroad simply stopped at the next station and asked all guests to depart and walk toward the park exit. For some guests with young kids, this created an unexpected problem. Strollers were not allowed on the train, and many parents had left them at the station where they boarded, which in some cases was far from where they were exiting. Some attractions finished their ride or show circuit before emptying, but one visitor remembered that, quote, we were on Space Mountain when the ride just stopped and they emptied it. At this point, more cast members began to learn about the attacks over the internal walkie-talkie system. The background music was turned off, stores were closed, the information that spread through the park was loose and it's sometimes inaccurate. Quote, when we were walking away, one guest recalled, a Disney staff person walked over and said, New York and Washington had been attacked and we were at war. In the Magic Kingdom, cast members, starting at the back area of the park, held hands to create a human rope that stretched across the length of walkways to slowly guide guests toward Main Street and then to the exit. They were instructed to move slowly and not to touch guests as they progressed. Following behind the rope of cast members were security teams to make sure no one was missed. The backstage route behind Main Street, the one used for special events, was opened to more quickly disperse guests outside the park. Guests were given return tickets as they left the park. Many of them walked to nearby hotels where they stood around TVs in lobby areas and watched continuous news updates. Others called relatives. Buses that carried guests back to resort hotels were eerily quiet, with many people staring at the floor or looking out windows. Over at Universal, all team members were told not to run as they were clearing the parks, not even if there was a security violation, as managers were fearful that one or two people running might incite panic and create a stampede. Once the parks were closed, one cast member recalled that they, quote, were huddling in the utilidors, watching what was happening on the break room televisions. It was so quiet. 
Even the AVAC garbage chutes were silent since there was no trash being dumped. I spent most of my shift and some time afterwards in the Mouseketeria, watching the TVs in stunned silence. According to the Orlando Sentinel, some Disney executives were relocated to a temporary command center to plan how to manage this crisis. They knew that the FAA had closed airspace above the resort due to a fear that the Disney parks might be a target for another attack, as the parks, particularly the castle at Magic Kingdom, was a symbol of American entertainment and American values. Theme park cast members and those at Downtown Disney were released from work and went home. Throughout the Orlando community, most cast members scheduled for second or third shift work quickly learned that they didn't need to report to the resort that day. Quote, One of my five roommates woke me up and I saw the planes crashing on Good Morning America over and over. One member of the Disney College program explained. They scrolled a message across the bottom of the screen that said that Walt Disney World cast members should not report to work and that all four parks were closed. I picked up our landline phone and could not call out to my family in California because the lines were overrun with calls. All I heard was a busy signal. Even though the parks were closed, Disney kept its hotels open, hoping to create a type of normalcy there. Quote, The resorts tried to do everything they could, one guest remembered. They kept the pools open until midnight, and they had characters roaming all around the boardwalk area. The cast members were doing the best they could to help and try to keep a calm atmosphere. This guest, staying at the Yacht Club, also recalled military aircraft crossing the sky. Quote, at one point, he added, a gunship flew overhead so closely that my wife could clearly see someone manning one of the machine guns. As airports closed, many Disney guests found that they had no way to get home. They were essentially stranded at the resort. Add to these problems, one Disney cruise ship, the Disney Magic, was making its way back from the Bahamas with 2,500 guests on board ready to dock the following day. Arrangements were made for these guests to stay at Disney World hotels if the airports weren't yet open. In Anaheim, out of a sense of caution, park areas were cleared of most workers in case Disneyland might be targeted for an attack. The tensest moments came just before 9 a.m. Pacific time, three hours after the first attacks in New York. Quote, Word suddenly came through park radios to evacuate all buildings, one cast member in California recalled. A report had been received that planes were headed toward the resort. Still another cast member recalled trying to evacuate people from offices. Quote, I vividly remember running through the buildings with my boss, searching every room, opening every door, and yelling to get out of the building now. Once outside, cast members gathered in pre-designated evacuation areas, areas that were originally identified in case of a fire or earthquake. They heard commercial jets passing overhead, the low thrum of their distant engines, but none descended toward the resort. About 9.45, cast members were told that it was safe to re-enter office and training buildings. Shortly afterward, Managers met in the Lincoln Theater to develop a plan and review security procedures. The resort would remain closed for at least the rest of the day. Quote, the meeting was very emotional, one recalled. It may have been the first time for many of those people to realize that this was serious. This was not a drill or a test. Those who were on property ate at the Inn Between, an employee cafeteria behind Main Street. But as the food service team stayed home, managers took turns cooking meals. For most of the day, downtown Disney remained empty or nearly empty. Later in the day, hotel guests were invited to watch classic Disney films free of charge at the downtown Disney Theater. The resort also sent characters over to the hotel to entertain guests stranded on property. In Washington, D.C., members of Congress gathered on the steps of the Capitol to sing God Bless America. In New York, at the flagship Disney store, employees removed all Disney merchandise from the front display windows 
and instead put up a statement Walt Disney had offered on radio shortly after America had entered World War II. Quote, Tomorrow, it began, will be better for as long as America keeps alive the ideals of freedom and a better life. On Broadway, Disney shuttered its production of The Lion King for two nights. Like other shows, it reopened two days later on September 13th. After watching members of Congress sing God Bless America at the Capitol, some on Broadway were inspired to do the same. That week, many Broadway shows ended with the cast singing as an encore, God Bless America, on stage. In Burbank, like other studios, Disney scrambled to push back release dates for films that might seem insensitive or inappropriate during a national tragedy. Of all the major studios, Disney had the highest number of problematic films on their release schedule. They faced a particular problem with a star-filled comedy called Big Trouble, as it featured one sequence where a nuclear bomb packed into a suitcase was unknowingly carried onto a plane. It was scheduled for release on September 21st. There was no possibility that this film, despite millions already spent on advertising, could be released until well into the following year. Even when it was released the following April, the public was still so sensitive to issues with air travel that Disney barely supported the film. Big Trouble starring Tim Allen moved through theaters quickly. It cost $40 million to make. It took in less than $10 million, a staggering loss. Beyond Big Trouble, Disney had another problematic film on its fall schedule, Bad Company, starring Chris Rock and Anthony Hopkins. Though the movie featured no problematic sequences, such as a bomb on a plane, it was the last major motion picture to be filmed inside of the World Trade Center. It, too, would need to be pulled from its December release date and pushed back to the following summer. But the most serious problem concerned the animated feature earmarked for a summer 2002 release, a feature with most of its scenes animated and shot. Lilo and Stitch was the story of a biological experiment gone wrong named Stitch, who escapes to Earth only to have his home planet attempt to recapture him. In the original, unreleased version, Stitch and his friend Lilo are captured by a military representative from Stitch's home planet, only Stitch manages to escape while Lilo is held captive on a spacecraft. To rescue Lilo, in the original version, Stitch and his friends take over a commercial jet to pursue the spacecraft. They fly it as part of a chase sequence through tall downtown buildings of Honolulu, turning it sideways and running its landing wheels against skyscraper windows, causing glass to rain down on streets below. More than once, they nearly crash into occupied buildings. It was the central set piece of the film's climax. After September 11th, the entire sequence would need to be redone, even though most of it was already animated, digitally painted, and shot. The story beats would remain the same. Only in the revised version, Stitch and his friends would steal a spacecraft, not a commercial jet, one whose control area, even in the final print, looks remarkably similar to a 747. The aerial chase wouldn't be staged in a city with tall buildings, rather in the lush mountains of Hawaii, far from any place that looked like New York. In the days following the attack, Theme park and studio employees were expected to return to work, but Disney employees in New York, in marketing, publishing, and in their new internet division were given time to manage their grief, anger, and feelings of anxiety. In the days that followed, they were told that they could come into work or work from home as matched their comfort levels and their feelings of security. Quote, in the meantime, one company message read, Please know that your safety and that of your loved ones is our top priority. On the night of September 11th, to cast members, CEO Michael Eisner released a statement. It began by saying, quote, Everybody acted with stoic determination to maintain Disney operations in efficient and caring ways. 
and it ended with Eisner's overall understanding of the company's mission. Quote, let me say that our company around the world will continue to operate in this sometimes violent world in which we live, offering products that reach to the higher and more positive side of the human equation. But already it was clear it would take months, if not years, for the nation to recover from this tragedy. On the morning after the attacks, September 12th, a spokesperson for the Orlando International Airport told passengers holding tickets that they didn't know when air travel would resume, but it wouldn't be any time before noon. Airports would remain closed for the entire day, and when flights did resume with new security protocols on September 13th, the FAA prioritized those flights that had been stranded mid-route to fly to their original destinations. It would take days to complete these flights. Regular air travel, even for those returning from vacation, wouldn't begin for days. The parks at Disney World reopened on Wednesday, September 12th, to extremely low crowds and to heightened levels of security. At this time, Disney owned no metal detectors and had no security screening areas. Instead, guests were handed recently printed notices that said, quote, for your safety, we have heightened our security efforts at the Walt Disney World Resort. All packages, parcels, backpacks, etc. will be inspected prior to entering our parks. For Disney, which viewed the parks as an escape from reality, the security tables represented a change. For decades, Disney had presented their parks as a place where guests left behind the troubles of the real world and entered realms of fantasy. The inclusion of security tables just outside the entrance to the parks was a reminder that even at Disney, the troubles of the real world couldn't always be ignored. One guest at the resort for an extended vacation returned to the Magic Kingdom that day to find folding tables being used as new security checkpoint stations. Quote, it was at these tables, he said, where it finally hit you especially since they weren't there the day before. One cast member recalled, quote, The next day, September 12th, the parks were literally ghost towns. Only the hotel guests were really in the park. I remember working the monorail ticket booth in the morning, and I didn't sell a ticket, just processed travel vouchers. It was very surreal because only two days before it was packed. Another guest recalled, quote, the parks were open, but definitely not crowded. We went back to Animal Kingdom, and all day long there were fighter jets in the sky over the park. Disney World is in fairly close proximity to Cape Canaveral, so it was this airspace being patrolled. Some guests found solace in attractions that spoke to patriotism, such as the Hall of Presidents and the American Adventure. One cast member remembers watching the Spirit of America Fife and Drum Corps perform in World Showcase, a small musical group presenting colonial music, which was often overlooked by guests. Quote, On this day, she explained, their performance jolted to the quiet like a knife. People didn't continue to walk about. Guests stopped. They gathered around them. Around the resort, many tourists considered canceling their return flights and instead tried to book rental cars and drive home. But overnight, rental car prices had risen sharply. Some car companies were asking over $1,000 for cars picked up in Florida and dropped off in another state. But at least one company reached out to those stranded. A representative of National Rent-A-Car in Orlando said, quote, because of the current tragedy, we're waiving the out-of-state drop-off fee today. Basically, everybody is going home in a car. Cars sold out quickly. Other tourists bought Greyhound tickets to make their way home. Some stranded in the area were part of children's groups, such as Sunshine Dreams, which offered trips for ill, physically challenged, and abused children. For these visitors staying at the Radisson Towers, the theme parks worked together to send over characters for the kids. Disney sent Mickey, Minnie, and other characters, while Universal sent Scooby-Doo, and SeaWorld sent a walk-around version of Shamu. 
It was likely the first time that characters from all three resorts were part of a combined event, a collaboration that would be repeated in the days that followed. But behind the scenes, beyond the heightened security and nervous visitors, the largest business activity at the Disney Resort concerned cancellations. Waves of calls came in to call centers canceling trip after trip after trip. Conferences and banquets were also canceled. At the parks, Disney canceled special events, the first of which was a celebration of Mexico's Independence Day, initially scheduled for the Mexico Pavilion at Epcot for Sunday, September 16th. At Universal, the resort edited the pre-show video for the park's relatively new and very popular Spider-Man ride. The original pre-show video included scenes of various villains trying to steal the Statue of Liberty. The animated video was edited to remove an attack staged in Lower Manhattan, the same area of New York where the towers once stood. In the past, Universal, where many rides were focused on disasters, had closed down certain attractions out of a sensitivity to recent events. In Orlando, the park had delayed the opening of the Twister attraction after tornadoes moved through Florida. In California, Universal Hollywood shut down the earthquake segment of its studio tram tour after the 1994 Northridge earthquake. But this was the first time. Universal altered an attraction due to a terrorist attack. At Disney, Pleasure Island canceled its nightly New Year's Eve party. The celebration, which featured festive music and confetti, seemed out of place in the days after September 11th. The more somber Illuminations, with its thematic focus on world unity, continued to play at Epcot, as did the evening fireworks at Magic Kingdom. The morning after the attacks, skippers at the Jungle Cruise needed to reconfigure their script to avoid the crashed plane along the jungle banks. In recent years, the jungle had adopted the back half of a Lockheed 12A aircraft. The front half was used in the Casablanca scene on the great movie ride. This jungle prop presumably the remains of a downed plane, suddenly became an issue for the ride. Quote, the next morning, one cast member explained, I returned to work at this Adventureland attraction. I discovered that we had a major problem. Our fun-loving wisecracking spiel usually included the down plane just before the hippos. The usual line goes, It's plain to see how I landed this job. I took a crash course. Obviously, any airplane crash jokes were now completely inappropriate. Some skippers tried to distract their crews in this area of the attraction with other jokes. Others, such as myself, had a brief moment of silence. In the days that followed 9-11, Disney World cut back shifts as the parks were empty. It moved closing time at the Magic Kingdom from 9 p.m. up to 7 p.m. Quote, all college program hours were cut to the minimum, one college program member said. It was a tough time. Before that, we could pick up overtime galore. After nothing. Many of the college program kids from the East Coast lost family members or their parents got scared and they had to leave early from the program. Beyond the college program, regular cast members saw their hours cut as well. But even during times of crisis, Disney was unable to severely limit labor costs, as so much of the guest experience requires cast members. It takes roughly the same number of cast members to operate Pirates of the Caribbean when the park is 75% full as it does when the park is 15% full. Friday, September 14th, brought Tropical Storm Gabriella through Central Florida. Though the four Disney parks and Universal stayed open, SeaWorld closed at 1 p.m. to prepare for rain as the park was near empty anyway. The few guests who were there received complimentary tickets for another visit. At Gatorland, a regional attraction not far from Disney World, managers made the decision to open that Friday. But as park president Mark McHugh explained, quote, we hadn't had a single person by noon, so we made the decision to go ahead and shut down. 
That weekend, some hotels in Orlando were near empty. Most guests in the rooms were stranded there from vacations that started before September 11th. According to the Central Florida Hotel and Lodging Association, many hotels were below 50% occupancy. Some reported occupancy rates below 25%. These resorts typically averaged 79% during this period of the year. 55% explained a representative for the industry was the break-even point. Quote, it will take some properties several months to recover from this, explained the vice president of Rosen Hotels. The loss of revenue is staggering. Convention groups are canceling blocks of hundreds of rooms at a time. By Saturday, the Orlando airport was halfway back to normal, helping people on vacations return home. That day, it boarded 440 flights, rather than the usual 900, largely due to security delays for the new screening process. It would take many days until the airport could handle 90% of their usual flight load. Many passengers at the airport were filled with anxiety as they wondered if air travel was safe. Quote, you find yourself studying people's faces, one traveler explained, watching them a little more and wondering who could be the next terrorist. To minimize anxiety, all three resorts sent costume characters over to Orlando International, mainly to ease the fear of children who might have seen the attacks replayed on TV. Disney sent Mickey and Goofy, while Universal sent Popeye, and SeaWorld again, Shamu. They comforted travelers as they made their way through a hastily assembled security line. Elsewhere in the airport, some lounge areas that typically played CNN nonstop were converted to family-friendly alcoves that played Stuart Little and The Land Before Time. And from there, Disney World was changed. One guest visiting the following week explained, quote, there was a sadness in the air you could feel. I have to admit I did feel guilty for being there. Due to so few guests in the park, we were able to see and ride everything quickly. We ended up going back to the hotel long before the park closed that day. On September 27th, speaking from the O'Hare Airport, President Bush encouraged people to return to their previous ways of life. Quote, Fly and enjoy America's great destination spots, he said. Get down to Disney World in Florida, take your families, and enjoy life the way we want it to be enjoyed. But Americans simply weren't ready for vacations, nor would they be for many months. Disney attempted to cut costs, even so far as removing hot dog carts from Disneyland, as with such low attendance, the carts no longer made money. At Disney World, the plans for the 30th anniversary were scaled back as few people were coming to theme parks that season. Beyond this, a large celebration seemed in poor taste. Paul Pressler, who was then the president of the theme park division at Disney, explained that after 9-11, visitation patterns changed. Many people were essentially unwilling to fly, which led to a cut in airline service. In December, two months after the attacks, 66% of Disney World visitors arrived by car, which identified guests most likely to book a Disney World vacation as living in the eastern portion of the continental U.S. There was a particularly sharp drop-off with international visitors. Pressler also explained that, quote, a greater proportion of Disney World's visitors are locals. In 2002, Disney discounted hotels, discounted annual passes, and offered other perks to encourage higher levels of travel. But tourism wouldn't rebound for a long time. In 2000, before the attacks, 15.4 million visitors came to the Magic Kingdom at Disney World. In 2001, it was down to 14.7 million, with a substantial fall off in the final three months of the year. In 2002, 14 million. In 2003, again, 14 million. Disney World wouldn't surpass the attendance levels they saw in the year 2000 until 2005. The recovery would take four years. It would take years for most Americans to feel finally 
that they were on the other side of this tragedy, in a new America more focused on security and safety, an America that was both similar to and different from the one that existed on the morning of 9-11. As I finish off this episode on the 20th anniversary of September 11th, I'm reminded of a number of concerns. Those who lost their lives in the attack, the bravery of the first responders who risked and in some cases lost their lives in an attempt to save others. Anniversaries like this one are not only about remembering the events, but also honoring sacrifice and giving life again through an act of memory to those who have passed. But I'm also reminded of something else, how much the after effects of 9-11 reflect the current situation with the pandemic, from reduced crowds at theme parks to a scaled back celebration for a major resort anniversary, from bumped release dates for major films to the shuttering of Broadway. This year, The Lion King will reopen on Broadway on September 14th, exactly 20 years and one day after the same production reopened following the attacks of 9-11. The pandemic is different than 9-11, but it's also a type of disruption that deeply affects many aspects of entertainment. I bring this up because if you're older than 20, you've been through this period of deep disruption before. It took the Disney parks, four years to recover from 9-11. It was a period with few new attractions, minimal projects. But again, for those of us who are old enough to remember, we got through it all. The world was different after September 11th. I was living in Florida at the time of the attacks. I remember the empty parks. I remember seeing the security stations for the first time. I remember canceled projects. I remember a feeling of trepidation for months following the attacks about visiting a mass entertainment site like the Disney parks. 2001 was a difficult year. So was 2002. But then things improved. I don't think there are many people who would say that the period from 2005 up through 2020 wasn't a good period for films and theme parks. Some of the most technologically sophisticated and deeply themed attractions opened during these years. And I think that may be a useful perspective to keep in mind. That recent history can be a guide for how to engage the future. Florida right now is coming off the peak of the Delta wave for infections. California is still rising. Films, at least some of them, are beginning to be bumped back from 2021 to 2022. But if history is precursor to the present, there'll be a period after all this where the problems of the pandemic will be washed away. And even if the world is somewhat different following COVID, we'll move back into a larger period of creative growth and exploration, just as we did a few years after 9-11. I'll be back next Sunday with a new episode. If you enjoy this podcast, if you find it a meaningful part of your week, you can support us by becoming a monthly subscriber over on Bandcamp. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens of extra episodes. Just yesterday, we added a Halloween update for our audio guide to Disneyland. But the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.